Happy Sabbath, everyone. Hey, really good to see you, all of you guys. Uh, last week I was gone because I was at uh, Kayam. Uh, let me show you a picture of Kayam. Anyone you see that looks familiar? Except me. Anyone you guys see that looks familiar? Yeah, Isaiah's right here. Okay. So they will be going to Mongolia this year. And so I was with them for a week and I came back yesterday. And also, I think uh, Jane is also going. Uh, to Mongolia as well. Um, and also, Julie will be going to Mongolia pretty soon as well. So uh, a lot of, lot of people uh, related to our church will be going to Mongolia and serving Mongolia. So uh, that's great. Uh, so keep uh, Isaiah, Jane, and also Julie uh, in your prayers and in your thoughts uh, as they will be going to Mongolia. As you guys know, we've been on this series, or if you don't know, if this is your first time here, that's cool, that's cool too. But um, we've been going over the fruit of the Spirit. Now, when we're talking about a lot of different fruits, uh, and these are the fruits that we went over, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Most of the fruits, if you look at here, most society, most people in our society are very fond of it. They go, yeah, we want more love. I want more joy. I want more peace in my life. Uh, when we talk about, like, helping out refugee and foreigners and these kind of things, too, uh, I mean, people outside of church, they're like Christians. I don't, I don't agree necessarily with what you guys believe, but that's great that you guys are helping out and wanting to have more love in this world. And so we kind of had to have the wind, wind on our backs. And they go, this is great, Christians, you guys should continue to do these things. But today, the fruit that we will talk about which is humility or um, gentleness. When it comes to this fruit, most of society kind of looks at it like, huh, humility, gentleness. It's kind of like a cow looking at a new gate. They're like, huh, is that really important? Is that really necessary? Is that something that's important in my life? So it's kind of like the society, actually, uh, whereas the other fruits, it's kind of like the wind on our back. When it comes to humility, when it comes to gentleness, it's actually wind on our faces. So let me read a quote really quickly for you. Uh, and this is what one of the commentaries uh, actually had to say about this humility. Humility came under attack in the ensuing decades. So in our generation, a different ethos came to the force, which the, soci the sociologists call expressive individualism. So now, again, uh, humility, it's not very important for us. Instead of being humble before God and history and moral salvation, uh, uh, God and history, moral salvation could be found through intimate contact with oneself by exposing the beauty and power and the divinity within. Basically, what is it saying? It's basically saying hum humility is not very important for us anymore. Why? Because we don't really need to look to God anymore. Instead, we just need to look at ourselves. So Why? have humility before God. Why is that important? Humility. Uh, today, we're going to actually talk about three different things about humility. We're going to see the sickness that we have inside of us. We're going to see how we would actually look like if we were healthy. And we're going to actually see the cure as well. And so we're going to talk about these three aspects of humility. Okay? So let's go into it right away. Paul is writing a letter to a church, and he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Basically, what is he telling the church? He's telling them, hey, be in unity, all right? So what does that tell you about the church? That tells you that church is not in unity. Does that make sense? And that's why he's saying, come on, you guys are going to make me happy if you guys are actually united. Okay. So let's look at just, not church, but our society in general. This is what all of us desire, right? We don't want war. We want peace. We don't want things like this, like where refugees have to run away because of war and die. We don't, we, when we look at these things, we go, yeah, we don't want these things in our world. And again, this is what Paul is saying as well. Paul is saying, hey, let's all love each other. Let's all be united in the mind, let's not have war. Let's not have conflicts. Okay. And you might say, well, this is not actually talking about, you know, people outside, but it's actually talking about the church. And right. It's funny that even within church, where 
we come together because we share same belief. And okay, and a lot of us being Korean, we're of the same race as well. But again, why is it that we, most of us, same race, most of us, same faith, but how is it that even at church, we have conflicts, we have issues, we fight? So again, the Bible tells us it's because we have a sickness, we have an issue. Humanity, there is a problem. And that's why, no matter how much we try to unite, things are always falling apart. We're getting into conflicts, we're having wars, we're having disagreements, arguments, miscommunication. Therefore, we have issues. So what does it say? The Bible actually tells us, continuing on, in the next verse, what, the, what our problem actually is. It tells us right here, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So why do we fight? Why do we have issues? Why do you fight with your husband or wife? Why do you fight with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Okay, why do you fight in your relationship? Why do we have conflicts? It comes down to this. Selfish ambition or conceit. Now, we're going to uh, explore this word, conceit. So let me give you guys a, a quick Greek lesson. Um, so the word conceit actually is kenodadodoxis, okay? When I, I always feel like insecure saying like Greek words because uh, we have a Greek scholar in, in, the, in the room and she always uh, lectures me afterwards. Okay, anyways, kenodadodoxis. Okay, so it's two words uh, that's put together. So here we go. Uh, Kenis, which means, okay, empty. Okay, doxa, which means glory. Therefore, the word uh, kinododoxis literally means empty of glory. Okay, so why do we have issues? Why do we fight? Why do we have problems? The Bible is actually saying all of us, we are empty of glory. We are hungry for respect. We are hungry for acknowledgement. Okay, and this is what Tim Keller, he actually uses this word. He says this is called the radical cosmic insecurity that all of us have. It's this idea that, hey, I'm in, I feel like I'm not important. I feel like I have no worth. I feel like there's something missing. And what do we do? So because we are empty, our hearts are empty of glory, respect, and honor, what happens if somebody rubs us the wrong way. What happens? We react. And we get angry. And we go, how dare you not respect me? How dare you not honor me? How dare you tell me that I'm not worthy? So you see, we become uh, very, very sensitive. Uh, one example of this is like, if you think of like gangsters, right? Um, and you see like news of stuff like that where like, you know, it's not, it's like, you feel like, you, you've seen news like this where it's like, it's not a big deal. Like, someone just, like, bumped into you and then, like, they pull out a gun and shoot them. Or, like, you know, you're, like, driving and then you, like, honk and they get so angry and they, like, crash into people. Like, stuff like that. When you see stuff like this, you're like, oh, man. This is an example of our glory emptiness that we have. We already feel like we're not important. We already feel like... Everything is just a wave of on the sand. Everything is just fading away. And because of that, when people snub us, ignore us, dismiss us, we are so sensitive to it. So, think about it. Isn't it better if somebody actually like, hates you or disagrees with you rather than them ignoring you at all? Right? If somebody says something negative to you, at least they're acknowledging that you're there. But if they don't text you back, if they just ignore, you know, you go high five and they, they don't even see you, or they forget your name, we feel, again, what Tim Keller calls this cosmic insecurity within us. And we become extremely, extremely sensitive and offended. Again, We have issues, we fight, we have conflicts. Why? Because of this 
insecurity that way we have within us. Okay, so again, why is it that we are empty of glory? Well, the Bible actually gives us a pretty good diagnosis. And actually, I don't know if there's any, any better diagnosis of why we're so glory empty. Uh, if you can find another one, please tell me. But the Bible actually says it's because in the Bible it tells us what? Humans, we were created for eternity. Right? We were created for eternity. We were created with value. But ever since we decided to defect and go against God, all of a sudden, we start to fade away. We start to die. We basically have disconnected ourselves from the power source. And because of that, every single day, we feel it. We feel like we're fading away. Some of you guys who are getting older and older, you have to put on more makeup. Right? You got to work out even harder. I was telling Brian, like, last year when I went to Kayam, I had so much more energy. This year, I mean, I feel it. <laughs> I feel my age. Okay, some of you guys might think, oh, Pastor looks really tired. I'm super tired right now. Okay? It's because why? We're, we're fading away. We're getting weaker and weaker, whether we like it or not. And again, we more and more and more, we are reminded we're slowly fading away. And again, we want to hold on. We're like, why is it so empty? Again, the Bible tells us it's because we have separated ourselves from God. So we all have an issue, right? Next. So once again, we all want peace. We all want unity in this world. We don't want any more hatred. We already have enough. But the problem is, we're all contributing to this conflict, this anger in this world. Why? Because all of us are empty of glory. Okay. So what would it look like if we were actually healthy? Uh, let me just... I'll skip this stuff. Okay. So what would it look like if we we're healthy? It says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Now, when it comes to this word uh, humility, okay, if you look at any other Greek word outside of the Bible, any, any Greek literature, when it uses the word humility, it's always, always used as a neg negative term. It's always derogatory, right? Because the word humility, it's talking about modesty. It's talking about meekness. It's talking about deferential, right? Deferring yourself to other people. And the Greeks, how they thought of this word humility was, hey, those are attributes which describes slaves, servants. Because during back then, it was all about what? Honor, right? It's all about power. The more power you have, the more strength you have. That's what the leaders need. And if you have more strength, if you have more power, if you have more honor, that's what's going to keep society together. And that's why they had the ranking system a long time ago, like kings, or like nobles, right? All of these things were so important to them, the status. But do you know, actually, in the Bible, okay, this word humility, it's used about 270 times, and almost always this word humility is used positively. Okay? Why is that? Why is it that the Bible uses this word humility in such a positive light? Because again, most of us, we look at humility and we go, is that really important? Now, think of this. Think of actually the gospel. If you actually think of the gospel, then the word humility itself, or the concept humility, becomes very, 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 very important. Okay. Imagine I go to God and I say, God, I really like you. I think you have things that you can offer me. God, I want a relationship with you. I'm willing to open up hey, we, we've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. I like this stuff. Let me come to you. And here's, here's what I'm going to offer. Here's my resume. Here's the stuff I did. Huh? Look at this. How is it? Look at all the accomplishments. Look at all the talents I have. Here you go. Let's build a relationship. You know what God's, God's going to say? God's going to say, 
you have no idea who I am. You have no idea who you are. You have no idea what the cross of Jesus actually means in your life. Okay? But instead, you come to God and you say, God, I want to have a relationship with you. I have done absolutely nothing to deserve such relationship. I have done nothing but to shame your name. I have done nothing but to betray you. But only because of your grace, only because of the cross, I can come towards you and I can actually have a relationship with you. The whole concept of Christianity, the whole core message of Christianity, it starts off with this idea of grace. That you're not worthy. You have done nothing to deserve it. You have morally failed. But God actually comes and says, I still want to have a relationship with you. You still matter. And this is why humility within Christianity, 270 times, it's a positive thing over and over and over again. Why? Because, okay, there's a lot of things that we lack, and we know that. But humility is one thing you cannot lack in Christianity, okay? You can lack love. You can lack joy. You can lack patience, peace, all of these things, and still come to God. But you cannot lack humil humility. Because if you come to God with pride and say, this is what I got, it's never gonna, you're never going to connect with God. God is never going to be that God. You have created your own false gods. You will never see God for himself. What I'm trying to say is, humility is the prerequisite it's the connecting point between you and God. Without humility, without saying, I have failed, without saying, I am weak, I am broken, I am messed up, this whole idea of Christianity, it's going to mean nothing to you. And so that's why humility is such importance. Now, how do we know whether we are actually healthy, right? As, as far as where it comes to are we prideful or are we, do we have this idea of humility? So let me give you three characteristics. Uh, this actually comes from Jonathan Edwards. He's a pastor from uh, about 18th, 17th century. Um, great pastor, by the way. And these are the three things he actually says we need to look at, okay? And so we can see whether we're being humble or do we have humility or do we actually have pride in our hearts. So let's talk about these three things. So try to see... Okay, try to see if these are the, uh, uh, use this as the litmus test. Yeah. The first one is drivenness. Okay, drivenness. Now, most of the time we see drivenness, especially in this society we live in. I mean, we got to progress all the time. You can't stay the same. And so there is actually good aspect of drivenness. Okay. But you have to really see what your drivenness is driven by. Okay, what your desires, what your competitiveness, what your drive is actually really driven by. Okay, are you driven because you feel like you need to be better than other people? Okay, are you driven out of fear? Are you driven out of insecurity? This is what C.S. Lewis says, and I think he makes it really, really beautiful. He says this, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer, cleverer, better-looking than others. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, is your drivenness, okay, driven, is it motivated, is it fueled by wanting to get rid of your fears? Is it driven by this cosmic insecurity that you have because you feel like you don't matter if you don't have money? Is it driven because you feel like you don't have security? If you're not better looking, if you're not clever. He continues on, says, if everybody 
else, everyone else became equally rich, clever, good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud. The pleasure of being above the rest. Do you guys see that? Do you guys see this? Do you see why this vain glory, we're, we're so empty of our glory, we're so insecure, why do we compare? Because we feel better about ourselves. Why do we have to be above the rest? Because that's the only way we say, I have worth. I have importance now. I'm going to last more than others. Why are you driven? Why are you motivated? Why do you want to become rich? Why do you become, want to become successful? Is it for being better? Is it for the comparison? Is it to be above so that you are filled? Then you see that you're driven by pride. There is no humility. Humility, it will be the opposite, right? It doesn't mean that you're not driven. It doesn't mean that you have no desire. And this is very important because a lot of Christians, they go, oh, you know, I think, you know, like these, like, you know, secular people, they're so driven and it's so easy for Christians just to get lazy, right? And not pursue excellence. But again, you pursue excellence, you pursue greatness. Why? Because for the love of these things in themselves, right? You love other people, you help other people. Why? For the sake of loving them. Why do you want to work well? Why? For the sake of helping other people. Most of our jobs, we're helping people. We're doing good things. But again, if we're driven by pride, really, we're doing it because of ourselves. Because we feel so empty. But what if you could actually be filled? You don't have to feel this glory empty anymore. Now you can love for the sake of loving. Help for the sake of helping. Working just for the sake of working. Why? Because there's pleasure in those things. So that's the first one, drivenness. Are you driven for yourself, really? Or are you driven for the sake of these things itself? Second, oh, I put number three as well. But look at the second one, which is scornfulness, right? And this one is pretty obvious, right? This is your attitude. When you look at other people, are you scornful? Are you like, that person's so dumb. That person's so slow. That person's not as good as me. That person's not as skilled. So what happens? There's this, right? There's this um, idea of like uh, contempt, ridiculing, jeering. Again, it's one of the worst and most offensive manifestation of pride, right? I mean, we, we hate this. We, I mean, if, if I ask you guys, a lot, of, a lot of you guys, you go, what kind of people do you, do you hate? And yeah, again, uh, most of the time, it's these kind of prideful people, right? They actually show it. They go, I'm better than you. Again, why do they do that? Why do we do that? Again, we want to be above the rest. We feel good. We feel better. Humility is opposite. There's gentleness. There's meekness. You don't have to do this. You don't have to be above other people to make yourself feel better. There's peace that, are, that is already there. You don't have to say, I'm better. I'm better looking. You don't need that. Last one, self-consciousness. Oh, this one, this one is really cool. If you understand this, well, you have to understand it because if you don't understand it, you're gonna, the whole sermon is not going to make sense. Uh, but self-consciousness, this is really, really cool. It's a really cool concept. So most people think arrogance, pride, most of it think of it as either one or two, right? They're very driven. They're like, I'm better than you. I'm faster than you. These kind of things. They're very loud. But actually, if you think of humility, okay, you have to think of humility as actually not thinking of yourself at all. Some of you guys, you guys have really low self-esteem. You have really bad, like, really bad self-esteem. So you, think, you say things like this. You say things like, um, I'm really dumb. Like, I'm really slow. Uh, you, you put, you're constantly putting yourself down. You're constantly beating yourself up. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not skinny enough. Um, you're, you're afraid of compliments. 
You're afraid of any kind of attention. But do you see that self, low self-esteem, you're just as absorbed about yourself as someone who's arrogant? Do you see that? You're just as absorbed about yourself. You're only thinking about yourself. You're thinking, what would people look at? Uh, how would people look at me? And so, C.S. Lewis, as always. Actually, let's look at uh, verse 4 first. And that's why this is very important. Because we have to look at humility a little bit differently. Because most of us, we look at humility as like, you have to discard yourself. Um, you have to not even think of yourself. But look, let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So what it says here is, it doesn't say, okay, like hate yourself. It doesn't say don't even care about yourself. No, it says, look, at, you have to, of course, take care of your own interests. There has to be self-care, but also learn to care for other people. So humility, this is very, very important. Humility, C.S. Lewis says, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Very, very important, okay? So it's not, you know, like we normally think of humility, like for example, if somebody came up to me and said, Kirin, you're so good at leading praise, you're so good at playing guitar, what's humility? For most of them, we go, oh, I, 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 no, 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 like I'm not, no, I'm not that good. Or somebody comes up to you and says, wow, you look so pretty. No, 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 what are you talking about? That's what we think of humility. We feel like we have to discount ourselves. We have to put ourselves low. But even doing that, we're thinking, actually, there is pride in our hearts because we're thinking about ourselves. We're not thinking of others. Everywhere, whether it's pride or low self-esteem, your focus is yourself. And that's why the Bible, and that's why C.S. Lewis actually says, no, 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 that's not humility. Humility comes when you're not, when you're not thinking of yourself at all. You're not high on yourself. You're not low on yourself. You're not thinking about yourself at all. Okay, let me give you an example of this. For example, like, um, like I don't know if you, guys, if you guys know, but Josh, he like, what was it? Was it AC, ACL, MCL? So he was, he was doing uh, snowboarding. He was snowboarding and he, he hurt his knee, right? And so sometimes I talk to him and I ask him, how's your knee feeling? Okay, why am I asking him that? Okay, because... There is something wrong with it, okay? If I come to you and say, wow, today my neck feels great, right? Whoa, I can turn. Why do I say that? Because there was something wrong with it before. What I'm trying to say is the reason why we're thinking so much either highly or lowly of ourselves is because there is pain within us. Something is hurting. Something is broken. And that's why we're always so noticing it. That if somebody uh, forgets my name, I get so hurt. Somebody focuses on me too much, I get so ashamed. Why? Because there's something wrong with it. You see, if, my, if I didn't have a neck problem, I wouldn't go, whoa, my neck feels so much better. Why? I don't worry about it. I don't think about it. I don't go, whoa, my knee feels so good. Why? Because I didn't have a knee problem. If you don't have issues, you don't think about it. Why are we thinking about ourselves so much? Because we have this cosmic insecurity. Do you see that? And that's why he's saying humility is not thinking less of yourself because you're still thinking about yourself. Humility comes when you are not thinking of yourself at all. These are the people who have true humility. They're thinking about you. They're thinking about how can I serve others? They're thinking about how can I love others? How can I benefit others through my work? You see, that's humility. They're not thinking about what can I get from this relationship? How has this person hurt me? See, humility is thinking less of yourself. Okay. All right. Now, this is one of the issues. So uh, before I go there, sorry. So, we have an issue. We, we said, okay, if we actually had humility, it would look a little different. Now, let's go to our next section and the last section, which is what's the cure? 
See, how do we actually get cured? Because you guys are saying, I, maybe I don't want to be like this. See, I don't want to be so focused on myself. See, I don't want to continue to contribute to the conflicts in the world, in our church, in our family. I want to be free from myself. How do we actually get here? Now, humility is such an interesting concept because humility, humility itself, the more you focus on it, the more you have already failed. Okay? So even throughout the sermon, we've already failed. Okay? Why? Because again, we talked about this. Humility is thinking less about yourself. But as we were talking, you guys were thinking, okay, am I, am I humble? Or am I prideful? Already you failed. Okay? So this is what uh, C.S. Lewis, again, uh, he puts it really well. Uh, there's, a, there's a book that he wrote. It's called Screw Tape Letters. And basically, uh, it's like a novel that he wrote Basically, it's the senior devil uh, talking to the junior devil about how to fool, how to trap humans. And this is what he says. I see that your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to the fact? So he says, wow, your patient is being humble. Just let him feel that he is actually becoming humble. Catch him at the moment when he is really poor in spirit and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection. By Jove, I'm being humble. And almost immediately, pride, pride at his own humility will appear. You see what he's saying? He's basically saying, if somebody becomes humble, remind them that they're humble, then they'll be like, oh yeah, I am being humble. Then what happens? You focus on yourself, you become prideful that you're more humble than others. Does that make sense? So, you guys might have been looking at the three characteristics and you go, okay, yeah. Oh, man, I'm not driven. Oh, but that guy is driven, right? I'm not scornful, but that guy, that person is scornful. Again, what do we do? Even with humility of itself, we become prideful. So humility, it's a very, very touchy issue because the more you talk about it and the more you think about it, you don't actually find the healing in that you actually become more prideful, if anything. So what do we do? And that's why Paul actually goes into this beautiful song. And this is actually a song or a psalm that the early Christian church sang over and over and over again. Because what Paul says is, yes, the problem that we have, the conflict that we have in our churches and our family is conceit or pride. But he doesn't just say, hey, Try harder. Be more humble. He doesn't say that. Instead, he directs us to someone else. And that's really the cure for our pride as well. Having this mind among you, which is from yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Again, this, is, this was a song. This was something that everybody memorized. Okay, This was like... Uh, uh, like heart of worship, right? Everybody, if I say, let's sing heart of worship, then people will be like, uh, when the music, everybody would know it. It's kind of like that, right? These are things, what Paul is telling them is, this is what needs to be the song of your heart. This is what needs to be the affection of your mind, okay? So you're continuing on. By taking the form of servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, bestowed upon him the name that is above all names, so that at every name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. What is he doing? He's saying, okay, you have pride. All of us have pride. We have issue. He doesn't just say try harder, do better, try to be more humble. Why? Because it, that does not work. Instead, he says, focus on God. The only way any of us are going to have any, any glimpse of humility or self-interest is if we focus not on ourselves, not even on other people, like approval, but on God himself. You see? Because what is it talking about? Because it's talking about this idea of humility itself. God is this great, big God. He had everything that he wanted. You see, he is above everything. He doesn't need to compare himself. Why? Because he is the best. 
But he lets go of all power, all glory, all riches, everything. And he becomes low. He becomes humble. And he says, I'm willing to die for each and every one of you who are trying to be more rich, be more honorable. And he's saying, no, I have everything, but I'm willing to give all of it up for you. So what does this mean? This means this right here, the gospel. This is really the gospel, right? That Jesus actually came and because of that we have value. This needs to be our main focus. This needs to be the song of our lives. This needs to be the main affection. And that's why he's saying, sing, continue to sing the song over and over and over. Why? Because this will help you to let go of yourself and to focus on God himself. And if you do that, can you imagine? Can you imagine what your life would look like if you didn't feel so empty gloried? What if you were filled? What would your work actually look like if you were filled? What would your relationships actually look like if you had assurance of your love already? What would our church look like if we were not full of people who are trying to be a vacuum and steal each other's glory from each other and compare one another and ridicule one another? What if we actually became a church where we could actually be united because we don't need to suck each other anymore. We don't need to suck love from each other. We don't need to suck glory from each other anymore. But we could just love one another. We could actually give to one another. What would our families look like? What would the city look like? See, and that's what God is offering here. God is saying, stop. Stop trying to suck glory from other people. I know you are empty. I know you need security. I know you need love. Focus on me. Don't focus on others to make yourself feel better. Don't focus even on yourself. Focus on me. You will receive what you need to find the fulfillment in me. Let me just end with a story. I know I, I, talk, I kept talking and talking, uh, but let me just end with a story. There was a hiker. Um, went to... Uh, wanted to climb this very, very high mountain. But, you know, he was like, I got this. I don't need all of these. I don't need all of these different tools. As he was going up, he realized he just couldn't go on anymore because it was just too hard. He was coming back down, and one of the women said to him, if you'd gone up the way you came down, you would have come down the way you went up. One more time. Some of you guys are still processing it. He says, if you've gone up the way you came down, which is hum humble, okay, then you would have come down the way you went up, which is having confidence. Okay? So what is it basically saying? Humble yourself before our great God, and in due time, God will lift you up. Let's go into time of reflection.